Hello viewers, welcome to Newsweek South Asia, a show where we will provide you fresh insights into South Asia's geopolitical, strategic and security situation. Let's take a look at the headlines first. India and US join efforts to combat terrorism. Pakistan's employment downfall triggers illegal migration. China's help to Pakistan army yet another addition to dead trap diplomacy. Let's begin the show. Terrorism, a problem faced by the entire world, now needs joint global efforts in counter-terrorism. Carrying the same spirit forward, India and the US now have joined their efforts to counter-terrorism. India's Prime Minister Narendra Modi, on his recent state visit to Washington, cemented this, the India-US alliance against terrorism. A report. Along with having solid economic ties, India and the US also cooperate in the fight against terrorism. After US President Joe Biden met Indian Prime Minister Narendra Modi at the White House, both sides strongly condemned the use of terrorist proxies, cross-border terrorism and all forms of international terrorism. Both sides called for the perpetrators of 26-11 Mumbai attacks and the Pathan Court attacks to be brought to justice. India and the US exchanged views on the threats posed by UN-designated terror groups and emphasized on concerted actions against terrorist networks and called on Pakistan to ensure its territory was not used as a base for militant attacks. While addressing a joint sitting of the US Congress, PM Modi spoke about the pressing danger of radicalism and terrorism. In a strongly worded statement, he stated that there cannot be any ifs or buts in dealing with terrorism and sought action against state sponsors of terrorism in a veiled attack on Pakistan. More than two decades after 9-11 and more than a decade after 26 11 in Mumbai, radicalism and terrorism still remain a pressing danger for the whole world. <laughs> These ideologies keep taking new identity and forms, but their intentions are the same. Terrorism is an enemy of humanity and there can be no ifs and buts in dealing with it. <laughs> we must overcome all such forces sponsoring and exporting terror. Following the joint statement of the US and India, Pakistan Foreign Ministry stated that it was stressed US should avoid making any statements that may be interpreted as supporting India's unfounded and politically motivated narrative against Pakistan. Soon after the US responded to Pakistan, the US State Department called on Pakistan to disband all terrorist groups including lashkar e taiba jaish e muhammad al qaeda and hizbul mujahideen and their associated front entities we do recognize that pakistan has taken some important steps to counter terrorist groups in line with the completion of its financial a action task force action plans this includes the, the arrest and conviction of sajid mir moreover we commend both pakistan and india for continuing to uphold the ceasefire along the line of control at the same time, however, we have also been consistent on the importance of Pakistan continuing to take steps to permanently disband all terrorist groups, including Lakshar e Taiba, Jaish e Mohammed, and their various front organizations. And we will raise the, re the issue regularly with Pakistani, Pakistani officials and will continue to work together to counter mutual terrorist threats, as we discussed during our March 2023 CT dialogue. Pakistan remains safe havens to terrorists and terror financing activities. 
the country has taken no significant counterterrorism measures on its turf. A report by the US in the past has highlighted activities of terrorist groups active in India, most of which were Pak-based terror outfits. The terror group lashkar e taiba remains active in Pakistan and continues to disturb peace and stability in the India's union territory of Jammu and Kashmir. In another report, US Counterterrorism Bureau highlighted Islamabad's meager progress in dismantling terror outfits. In recent months, terror outfits in Pakistan continue to target civilians and cops in cash-strapped Pakistan. According to US Congressional report, Pakistan is also home to 12 foreign terror organizations, five being India-centric, including lashkar e taiba and jaish e Muhammad. US officials have also identified Pakistan as a base of operations for numerous armed and non-state terrorist groups, some of which have existed since the 1980s. From radicalization of its youth to training and arming them for anti-India activities, Pakistan continues to keep terror outfits as part of its statecraft. Pakistan is struggling and so are its citizens. The South Asian nation is like any sinking ship where people are either struggling to remain afloat or abandoning it entirely for their survival. Amid the economic distress and political uncertainty, Pakistan is grappling with severe challenges like poverty, unemployment and corruption that have compelled many individuals to seek opportunities abroad. Many resort to unauthorized channels for migration. A report. In one of Europe's deadliest shipping disasters in recent years, a refugee boat carrying around 750 people sank off the Peloponnese Peninsula in Greece on June 14th. The boat was carrying some 300 Pakistanis along with Egyptians, Syrians and Palestinians. They were all illegal migrants who left their countries in search of greener pastures. The people who died on the shores of Greece on 14th of June is no coincidence. And it is not a one-off thing. It's going to happen again uh, because people are so desperate in both Pakistan and POJK. A majority of victims in the boat tragedy were Pakistanis who attempted the illegal passage to Europe due to the prevailing economic crisis, food insecurity, violence and job unavailability in the Islamic nation. Adil Hussein, a Pakistani who lives in Greece, is now searching for his brother, 43-year-old Matloub, at a migrants camp outside of Athens, where survivors of the shipwreck were transferred. His brother paid some 7,000 euros from Pakistan to make his way to Italy through Libya, said Hussein. His brother had been in Greece for more than 12 years before that, but was living illegally and had to return to Pakistan. Back home in Pakistan, the family members are dealing with immense shock and grief. In the hilltop town of Kwairata in Pakistan-occupied Kashmir, at least 28 people are either confirmed dead or missing in the Greece boat tragedy. The town, like many others in Pakistan, is known for its residents fleeing to Europe to try to earn a better living. Ayub, a construction worker, said his brother Yasin had borrowed money to pay 7,500 USD to an agent to reach Europe. Illegal migration is rampant. There is no factory, no one is doing it. It's a big deal. So, then, every person who is in Punjab is doing it. Some people are doing it, and some people are doing it. Some people are doing it, and some people are doing it. Some people are doing it, and some people are doing it. Pakistan's 
Pakistani authorities have arrested over a dozen alleged human traffickers in a widening manhunt after the boat tragedy. Defense Minister Kawaja Mohammad Asif, while addressing Parliament, said human traffickers deserve the sternest action. Main jo karne wali baat hai ki is karobar ko band hona chahiye. Ye na ho ki ye log jo kal giriftar hue hain, kuch log bhag gaye hain. Inke taane baane jo hai Turki mein bhi hain, wahan bhi inhone wahan pe panang gaye banaye hue hain, jahan pe log jaate hain, phir baat ke do do, three three, four four mein intezar karte hain. Is chitra Libya mein bhi hain. To mera khayal hai ki wahan pe bhi hamari embassies ko pata hoga ki ye kya karobar ho. A lackluster job landscape in Pakistan, further troubled by the country's perennially unstable political and security situation, has compelled youth to pack their bags and flee the country. Disillusioned by the country's political class, they are willingly navigating the illegal path that is fraught with both challenges and dangers. And even if the passage is successful, which it is often not, a large number of Pakistani nationals who reach foreign countries through illegal means are often deported. The youth of Pakistan and POJK, they say that, okay, we are going to die anyway because we have no jobs, there is hunger here, there is uh, destitute. Why not try and get to Europe or another country? At least if we can, if we, even, even if we die, we'll die trying for a better future. Between 2015 and 2020, more than 600,000 Pakistani nationals were deported from 138 countries for a range of reasons, including expired work permits and illegal entry using counterfeit travel documents. In recent years, the migration from Pakistan through illegal means is also due to the deteriorating security situation especially in Balochistan, Khyber Pakhtunkhwa, and Sindh provinces. As I have told you that Pakistan, there were very small industries, of manufacturing industries. Pakistan does not have manufacturing industries. Only one, there was only one steel mill uh, in uh, Karachi that was called as Pakistan Steel Mill. Now they have shut down it. And they are even selling their ports, their land, and everything Pakistan is leasing out. Now, the situation is that only 10% of the industries are working in Pakistan. Others are closed because the imports have been stopped in Pakistan. And Pakistan will sell. It's all natural and uh, national uh, assets to the different countries. This is a very dangerous situation. After the 2022 Pakistan floods, the World Bank estimated that up to 9 million more people in the country could be dragged into poverty. Over one-fifth of Pakistan's 220 million people are already living below the national poverty line, and the rising inflation is adding to their woes. The crippling economic situation in the South Asian nation is expected to force more people to risk their lives for the chance at a better life. If Pakistan has achieved any growth in the last few years, then it is because it has become a puppet of China. From domestic politics to foreign policy, Beijing is pulling all the strings. And what Pakistanis believe is, China's all-weather support to it in the form of military assistance and bailout packages, Beijing has penetrated right to its core as far as Pakistan's military mindset is concerned. Pakistan is joyfully accepting all substandard Chinese artillery to defend its borders, without realizing China always has an ulterior motive behind its supplies. We have a report. China North Industries Group Corporation Limited recently delivered the second batch of SH-15 to Pakistan Army. A heavy wheel self-propelled defense equipment which recently was spotted near the LOC. The first batch of the SH-15 was given to the Pakistan Army in 2022. Reports also suggest that several infrastructure development projects 
have been undertaken by China just to ensure its dominance and control in Pakistan. The thing is that Pakistan is not in a position to pay back the kind of debt which China has. Uh, China has not uh, waved off the debt which Pakistan owes to China. And that has not happened in spite of you know those two countries being uh, you know all weather friend. Investment per se apart from the CPEC projects uh, in other areas has been very very less uh, in spite of this friendship and economically uh, obviously there is a huge strategic dimension to this entire economic relationship. So, they would not mind coming to the rescue of Pakistan to make them feel that China is their only friend, not the United States. If you remember, uh, the US has been a close friend of Pakistan for a very long time, but uh, now it has been replaced uh, by China. All major investments made by China over time in Pakistan are either under the CPEC project, which could be worth more than 62 billion US dollars over time or in the form of bailout packages and infrastructural loans. This inflow of funds from China results in a major outflow of the revenue generated by the CPEC project. Similarly, infrastructural loans increase debt in Pakistan, raising major concerns for international bailout packages from the IMF. All of this increases the tensions for the already cash-stripped Pak economy which the country fails to realize even when its economy is nosediving. The investment, uh, as I said, you know, the investment are on, uh, on particular projects like, for example, uh, the energy projects, uh, then this Gwadar port, which, you know, where the huge port is coming up with, uh, you know, exclusive economic zone and that kind of the infrastructure development. Those has been priority areas, but they have not uh, invested uh, anywhere which will boost uh, Pakistan's manufacturing capacity. Because if you are not able to manufacture, if you are not able to export, uh, so your economy actually, uh, you know, is not helped by such kind of investment because Chinese model of investment uh, and uh, especially the kind of project they are doing under the BRI is mostly uh, you know build own transfer. So, they get their own money, they get their own people to work on it and after completion of the project they uh, hand over the project to the government and ask them you pay back the loan. Just like Afghanistan, Sri Lanka, Bangladesh, Vietnam and Myanmar, Pakistan is just another addition to the long list of countries that have fallen prey to China's debt trap diplomacy. These countries are being overburdened by China's loans and suffer steep economic downfall because of their inability to pay back China's loans. Pakistan, however, has invited China and has bowed down willfully, giving away its control to China, not realizing that all support by its all-weather friend comes with dubious ulterior motives of expanding its control and dominance in Pakistan. Afghanistan continues to witness terror attacks and there is no peace despite the takeover by the Taliban. The people are dying in violence perpetrated by other terror groups. Terror outfits have more freedom in Afghanistan than at any time in recent history. And there is no evidence that the Taliban leadership has made steps to curtail the activities of foreign terrorists in the war-torn country. Yunema in his latest report has stated that more than 1,000 Afghan civilians have been killed in bomb blasts and other violence since foreign forces left and Taliban stormed back to power in August 2021. A report. Since the Taliban takeover of Afghanistan following the US withdrawal in August 2021, the country has once again become hotbed of terrorism. According to a recent report of the UN mission to Afghanistan, more than 1,000 civilians have been killed in bombings and other violence. The report underscores the security challenges even after the end of decades of war. Three quarters of the attack, just over 700, were caused by improvised explosive devices, IED, in populated areas, 
including suicide bombings in places of worship, education centers, and markets. According to a press release issued in response to the UN report, the majority of IED assaults were carried out by Islamic State in Khorasan province. A Sunni militant organization and the principal Taliban adversary in the area. The Taliban leadership claims that they have gained control of Afghanistan at a time when it was on the brink of collapse and that they managed to rescue the country and government from a crisis. But in reality, the new Afghan government has done nothing to limit her activity on its soil. Killing of about 1000 people in civil war or whatever you call it, uh, I think that they are unfortunate. They, are, they have been killed by the various forces that have been present there for uh, 20 odd years. So it has been before that the Soviets. So this has been a misfortune of the Afghan people. They would want uh, possibly to live like the rest of the world in peace. And I think that eventually the world will have to come up with some kind of solutions. Uh, knowing too well and, and Taliban will also have to change its tracks because it is in the current scenario they are gradually completely isolating themselves so therefore they'll have to uh, adhere to the principles that they agreed in Doha Peace Accord and the UN Security Council resolutions and then only they can be they, they, they can be supported by the world. Terror groups are now able to operate freely under the Taliban's authority in Afghanistan, posing a significant threat of terrorism in the country and the wider region. As in another report released by the UN, it was mentioned that the link between Al-Qaeda and Taliban remains strong and symbiotic and the setup in Kabul has not delivered on counter-terrorism provisions under the Doha Agreement signed with the US. According to the report, nearly 400 Al-Qaeda fighters were in Afghanistan and there are signs that the terrorist outfit is rebuilding operational capability. However, the Taliban rejected the report, calling it biased and far from reality. US officials have long expressed skepticism over Taliban claims as when US killed Al-Qaeda leader Ayman al-Zawahiri last year in July, he was found living in a home in a central neighborhood of the capital, Kabul. The US stated that his presence there demonstrated that Taliban had broken the 2020 Doha Agreement. You see, as far as Al-Qaeda's expanding presence is concerned, it is a fact. And in fact, the Americans also knew before leaving and the NATO and others that Al-Qaeda was present in 15 at least governorates in Afghanistan and have been pretty active. They have been often at odds with the Taliban. But in Afghanistan, we must understand that there are neither Taliban as a homogeneous lot. They also have several groups in that which range from A to Z as far as uh, their adherence to uh, conservatism, excessive conservatism and uh, the way forward is concerned. But at the same time, we have um, ISIS, which is uh, ISKP, PK, and we also have the Al-Qaeda, which has been very much present there. The Taliban's victory in Afghanistan has not only provided the space for openly organizing the training camps, but also inspired terrorist organizations of various hues. Besides Al-Qaeda, Pakistan's Lashkar-e-Taiba, Jaish-e-Mohammed, East Turkestan Islamic Movement has also become active in Afghanistan. The 13th report of the Analytical Support and Sanctions Monitoring Team claims that Jaish e Mohammed maintains eight training camps in Nangahar, three of which are directly under Taliban control. All of these indicate that while Taliban assurances for not letting the terrorists operate from its soil have remained on paper, in reality, the Taliban administration is helping them. The time has come for the international community to decide on how to bring about a permanent ceasefire and an immediate cessation of violence in Afghanistan. Anything sort of this will constitute a serious threat to regional peace and security.
And with that, we come to the end of this edition of Newsweek South Asia. We'll be back next week with more news, views and analysis from the subcontinent. Meanwhile, do keep writing to us at nwsa at anin.com. This is Shivangi Mishra signing off on the behalf of the entire production team of Newsweek South Asia. Goodbye and take care.